All right. Well, this is uh, our third in this uh, series of three. Uh, it's been on the screen. If you've had a chance to look at it, the next series starts in September. I think it's the 20th or three Wednesdays, so you might put that down and we'll crank it up in. I want to thank all the table hosts for bringing people, uh, for you guys showing up that have been invited. Uh, we've had this, like we said last week, we've been doing this for over 19 years on these 12 times a year, three in a row, and it's really been amazing the things that have happened in the lives of men as a result of a one-hour luncheon. Unbelievable. And a lot of you are, are, could give testimony to that, and I'm uh, thankful for you all being here. So let's pray, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for letting us uh, huddle together. You never call us together to disappoint us, but always to understand who you are and what you want to do in our lives and through our lives. So, Lord, do it again today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, some men and some people simply don't get it. I mean, I don't know if it's a lack of intelligence or alertness or focus, but some people don't get the simplest things. So, the story is told about a man who walks into an ice cream store and orders a double scoop. He said, vanilla and chocolate. The store owner says, we don't have any chocolate please make another selection. Okay, strawberry and chocolate. I said, we don't have chocolate, sir. Then make another. He said, okay, make it a double chocolate. Man, you just don't get it, do you? How do you spell the van in vanilla? He said, V-A-N. He said, how do you spell the straw in strawberry? S-T-R-A-W. Okay, how do you spell the stink in chocolate? He said, ain't no stinking chocolate. He said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. There ain't no stinking chocolate. (laughs) I don't know what it takes us to get it, but anyway, I hope it'll spill over on some of you, and today you will get it. You need to know <clears throat> that when we do this, these luncheons and you've been invited, we're here to make a difference by God's grace in your life. There are zillions of lunches in Dallas, tons of stuff that goes on. This one is focused on your life. If you take something away today... Uh, that can change you and help you to be the person that God designed you for, to be, you will be a winner. So keep that in mind as we go along. So um, we're talking about this group of 90-year-old people that uh, were interviewed uh, by a student working on his doctoral thesis in University of Pennsylvania. And he just asked these people one question. Uh, that he said, listen, if you could live your life over again, how would you live it differently? And so the last two weeks, we've looked at two of the three things that they said. First of all, they said we would reflect more. And then we'll look at the second one and then the third one today. Reflect more. So a friend of mine in Orlando sent me this the other day. He said, country singer Billy Curriton recorded a song a few years ago, People Are Crazy, with the lyrics, God is great. Beer is good. People are crazy. And he said, I agree with the greatness of God, but I'm not sure about the beer. I think it's an acquired taste. But he, but, but he said, he's right about people. They're crazy. He said, I'm crazy. You're crazy. Everybody's crazy. And then he quotes a verse out of Romans with Apostle Paul when Paul said, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very things that I hate. That's all of our dilemma, if we're honest. And so how do we begin to deal with this reflection? Well, we reflected on the culture that we live in. And the culture we live in has gone crazy because people are crazy. It really is. It's people. Whether it's people in government, people in the middle, people down on the street, whatever it is, people are crazy. And when you're crazy and you're not getting your life together and beginning to think correctly so you can act correctly, then you're going to have craziness. And I've said the last few weeks, I've never in my lifetime lived in a time like we're living in now in our country. But it shouldn't surprise us. When people go crazy, crazy stuff happens. So we, over the last few weeks, we look at the culture. But the second thing we've done, we took a look and reflected on our, on our faith. A life without Christ in your life is a wasted life. There's a verse in 2 Peter. My wife gave me this a few years ago. She had done some 
research on it, and you can read it on your own. But 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7 says, the last part of verse 7, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now, you'll need to read the whole uh, verses all up to that point, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7. But the word destruction, if you look it up, means losing, loss, the state after death, wherein exclusion from salvation is a realized fact. In other words, it's saying people that don't come to Christ are going to have a place prepared for them apart from Him. Then it goes on to say in the research, a moment will come at the ushering in of eternity when every lost man will be confronted with the staggering loss of his or her salvation. The loss will suffer a horrible threefold realization. They will realize that He is Lord, He is who He claimed to be, that they are lost, and it's too late. Dear friends, we dink around and say, well, I'll come to Jesus when I get ready. No, you won't. The Scripture tells us unless the Lord is drawing you and giving you the ability to believe in Him, you're not going to believe. You say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll decide someday. Not to decide is to decide. And the posture that we have in, uh, as a person who has not yielded our lives to Christ is we're in, we're in danger. Often people don't tell us that. They'll treat us nice and sweet. Well, I know you. Let's, let's go have some coffee and let's have a donut and let's just hang out together and maybe something of my faith will spill over, but I'm not going to say anything about it. People that don't know Jesus and have Jesus in their life one day are going to be lost for eternity. You do not go into oblivion. You have a conscience. You will be alert and aware of where you are and that you missed it. Now, for those of you that don't know Christ, you need to be listening. For those of you that do know Christ, do you care about those around you that don't know Him? People in your family, people that you work with. I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, I could stand up here or sit up here and tell jokes and laugh, but at some point after the jokes, the joke's on you if you don't know Him. So we, we can't waste time. We've got to understand how to use our time. So if you look at the passage on the screen, it says, Therefore, be very careful how you walk, not as an unwise man or men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Another translation of that goes like this. Be, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Let me tell you, if, if we don't get up as followers of Christ, if you are one, and say, Lord, I want my day to be guided by you. I want to do what you want me to do. We can waste a lot of time. And I know, folks, if you don't want to waste your time. So there's a taproot, and listen to this as we look at the bottom line of what this is all about. It is of little use to use to cure symptoms unless you cure diseases. The taproot of all misery is sin, and until it is grubbed up, hacking at the branches is a sad waste of time. Cure sin, and you make the heart a temple and the world a paradise. We Christians should hail all efforts of every sort from making men nobler, happier, better physically, morally, and intellectually. But, but, let us not forget that there is but one effectual cure for the world's misery, and that is brought by Him who has borne the world's sins on a cross. So we can do all this stuff with political stuff and all these do-good things, do, do them all. But the bottom line is, if you don't change a man's heart, if he doesn't deal with the number one issue of the sin in his life, it's never going to get any better. So we need to understand that. Someone has said, when you have nothing left in this world but God, then for the first time in your life, you will learn that God alone is enough. He's enough. He is enough. So also last week, we said, look, these people said, well, listen, if I could live my life over again, I would reflect more. I, we had too much cocktail talk. But secondly, he said, we'd risk more. 
Now we're 95 years old. We are a risk. We can't risk anymore. The question was last week briefly, why don't we risk more? Two reasons. Number one, because we either have a weak relationship with Christ, too shallow, or we don't have one at all. And as a result of that, the second thing is we do not understand our personal value and worth. And we went through that in some detail. The Scripture says in Ephesians 2.10, where we take our thoughts from, that we are God's masterpiece. It's a little Greek word, poiema, masterpiece. He said, you are my masterpiece, whether you feel like it or not. The question then becomes, am I living like his masterpiece? Or do I tarnish my life and my living and my relationships and my days and do and I forget that I'm his masterpiece? How are you representing him, the one who created you? So here was the question last week. If you could do anything you wanted to do, knew you couldn't fail, and money weren't a problem, what would you do? And then we ended up last time with this quote. Men live lives of quiet desperation and die with their song unsung. Probably 80% studies say of men that go to work on Monday morning do not like what they do. And you spend most of your life working as men. So we need to figure out either something that's on our heart, a passion to do, or we need to take a new view of where we go every day and how God wants us to use us in that workplace. First of all, to, be, to deliver an excellent day's work, and number two, to make a difference with the people around us. Then number three, the people said, well, if we'd reflect more, we would risk more, but here's my favorite one. They said we would do more things that would outlive us once we're dead and gone. That's talking about a legacy. So, a story related to me by a great writer in this country said the following. About a dozen gray-haired men sat at the table in a prestigious country club, all former executives who had been highly successful, leaders, champions, <clears throat> bright, intelligent minds, there, these were risk takers who had led big lives, checkered with success and failure. Married between 45 and 60 years, these men clearly had plenty to impart to a younger generation. As I prepared to speak to them, I couldn't help but think that their gray heads only added to their dignity. They had asked me to speak for a few minutes on what I did around the country with families, and that's what I did. But what happened when I was finished speaking blew me away. What happened next was fascinating. It was as though I touched an open nerve. For 45 minutes, they peppered me with questions, peeling back their hearts, sharing disappointments, frustrations, doubts, and desires. They talked about their children uh, and how their children were so critical to them, pushing them to the fringes of their lives. They were treated as often as, adult, as unnecessary adults, except as babysitters. And they felt their family really didn't want their influence or their involvement. They said the only opportunities their churches offered were ushering, serving on the stewardship committee, and giving to the building programs. They lamented that the culture had become so youth-oriented, they felt emasculated, treated as though they were done and had nothing to give back. These men who had once been kings in their families, their businesses, and their communities, were for the first time in their lives uncertain what their role should be. Like broken antiques gathering dust in the attic, they were without purpose. But as they interacted, I could see in their eyes that they longed to be challenged again. War-hardened and savvy, these sage Soldiers wanted to fill their nostrils with the smoke of the battlefield and engage in the fight again. They really didn't want to trade their swords and armor for a five iron and a golf shirt. They realized that they were made for something far nobler than watching cable news or whatever stream watching you're watching now in a lazy boy recliner. I sat there, astonished at what amounted to grand theft Men robbed of their glory, no longer dreaming because of the complexity of forces that had cruelly swindled them out of their courage to step up. These men had been left behind, 
disoriented, lost. 1912, doing something great. 1912, the Titanic sank. And many courageous men stayed on that boat so the women and children could be rescued. What a rescue. Are you involved in anything in your life that matters eternally? Are you involved in anything that is making eternally an impact on the lives of people? Someone said this about legacy. Said it meant looking for uh, the legacy you could leave behind. This means, what will my children say about me, my life, my purpose, my relationship with God? The question is, am I living for me or God? Me or God? Money or God? Do I really put him first, or is that just religious Sunday talk? See, what, what God's after is authenticity in terms of an honest relationship, a real relationship with him. That makes a difference in our everyday lives. T.S. Eliot said, and the wind shall say, here were a decent, godless people, their only monument, an asphalt road, and a thousand lost golf balls. Doesn't matter a whole lot. So, someone said it this way. What do you want to be remembered for? Once it finally dawns on us that we will not be remembered for what we have accomplished or what we have achieved or how much money we have made, we acquire the ability to change in a fundamental way. We get a new paradigm. We have a new way of looking at things. So here's a question for you. Is what you are living for worth Christ dying for? So how do you want to be remembered? I think the Bible tells us very clearly, and the Bible is so down to earth and real, but there are only two things. When this planet's over, when you leave this planet, and you will someday, we all will, but only two things are going to survive the planet. Number one, God's truth. The Scripture says in Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of the God will stand forever. That's the living word, Jesus, and the written word, the Bible, the truth. The second thing the Bible says that will last forever are people. Everyone is going to live forever, either with God or without Him. If you look in Matthew 25, the Scripture says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So the, where are you going? You know, I see very few, in fact, no hearses that are pulling a U-Haul up behind them. You don't take it with you. You don't. And all the effort and all the stress and all the stuff we go through to acquire and acquire, but we're, we, we've missed the main thing. And in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that if we use what he gives us in the correct way. The chief end of my life and your life is to glorify God and enjoy Him together. That means make Him look good. He's already good, but make Him look good through your life. So how can you give God good press in these days? The other thought we need to remember is one day we are all going to die. Listen, remember we are not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We are in the land of the dying, going to the land of the living. Is that where you're going? Are you going to the land of the living or the land of opposite of that? You know, Christians, those who know Christ on this planet, in this city, in this room, are the only people on this planet that have an answer to the anger and the angst that's going on in our country right now. The answer is changing a person from the inside out. And so any other solution is only dealing with the symptoms, not the cause. So for me personally, I have decided that uh, I'm going to do two things primarily in my life, and I've done this for a long time. Invest my life in my relationship with Christ and follow Him day by day. And number two, invest my life in people and help them know Him 
and grow up in him and, in, and begin to become more and more the person he wants them to be, not only be, but do what he wants them to do. So, what kind of things last forever? Uh, let, me give you a couple, let me give you a couple thoughts here. Um, leading others to Christ, discipling men. So when's the last time any of you have sat down with somebody and told them about your relationship with Christ succinctly, not preaching at them, just sharing he's real to you, and ask them, do you know him? Is he in your life? That's what we're all supposed to be doing. We're be, we are to be on call constantly to do that in our lives. So the two things I'm going to commit my life to, and I do it every day, is to lead people to Christ and help them grow up. We call it discipling. Grow up so they can be fully mature, but also so they can help others come to Christ and help them grow up. We call that multiplying disciple making. It's all over the screen if you keep looking at it. So the question comes, what am I going to be doing? Then I'm going to give you some illustrations to pull this all together. My desire is before I die, a system will be set, in pl- a movement will be set in place to give 120 million men plus in this country a winsome presentation of Jesus and the good news of the gospel. I've said this many times before over the last few years. I need help to do that. Can you imagine the mark that could be left if a band of men in this city put together whatever it took to put that plan together and it started to be implementing? I believe that probably 80% of the 120 million men in the United States of America have never had a winsome presentation of the gospel. So, we got a great opportunity. And the second thing I'm, I'm giving my life to, the rest of my life, and need help for, is how do we get every community, every city in this country, a core of people that are discipling others, who disciple others, so that exponential factor kicks in and we take the planet. It's God's plan to change the planet. Are you doing that? So, we've got to use wisely the time we have left. Somebody sent me a note. I don't think they're here today, but if they are, I hope you are. I just sent this person a note, said, I heard you had a loss in your family recently. I'm thinking about you. And he said, thank you so much. He said, but we got to keep our foot on the gas. Is your foot on the gas? Are you moving ahead and making a difference for Christ in your home, your personal life? So uh, what are the kind of things that last forever? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts, and I'm going to give you some illustrations. When we contemplate the reality of death, we become keenly aware of the importance of leaving something good behind. Many who have been blasé about death at the end fear that their epitaph will read like the following penned by poet, the poet Keats. Here lies one whose name is writ in water nothing, meaningless. So the question then becomes, what can I focus on in my life, in the rest of your life, that's going to make the greatest difference? I want to share a story with you and then some illustrations to put this together. So I have a friend who is, lives in Pennsylvania. He's one of the most, uh, I think over the last 50 years, one of the most powerful communicators of the gospel in America. And he w- told me about this story he goes to a black Baptist church up in uh, Philadelphia, and he's a white guy in a black church, but he loves his black church, and he said, man, these people know how to preach. They know how to lay it out. But he said, they have this thing once a year where the students come home for either a Christmas break or in the summer, and the, uh, the pastor interviews the students, and they give reports on how their educational pursuits are going. And he said the older folks love it because a lot of them have never had the opportunity to go to college or the university. So they love seeing their children, the kids, going away and really working hard, and they love to hear the stories when they come back. So this is what Tony told me. He said the pastor got up when he addressed the kids, and he said he delivered some of these words, closing words. Children, he said, you're doing Great in your education, but let me say this. 
you're going to die. You may not think you're going to die, but you're going to die. One of these days, they're going to take you out to the cemetery, drop you in a hole, throw some dirt on your face, then go back to the church and eat potato salad. It's <laughs> exactly what happens, isn't it? Been any of those deals? Go back to the home. They got all this food laid out. Where are you? You're in the hole. You ain't getting to eat. But he goes on. When you were born, he said, you alone were crying and everybody else was happy. The important question I want to ask is, when you die, are you alone going to be happy and leaving everybody crying? The answer depends on whether you live to get titles or testimonies. Remember that, titles or testimonies. When they lay you in the grave, are people going to stand around reciting the fancy titles you earn, or are they going to stand around giving testimonies of the good things you did for them? Will they list your degrees and awards, or will they tell about what a blessing you were to them? Will you leave behind just a newspaper column telling people how important you were, or will you leave crying people who give testimony of how they lost the best friend they ever had? There's nothing wrong with titles. Titles are good things to have, but if you ever have to come to the point you have to choose between titles and testimony, choose testimonies. Now, let me give you some thoughts here. So, a friend of mine told me, being on an airplane one day, he said, across the aisle, he said, was one of the most stunning, beautiful, eye-catching women he'd ever seen in his life. And he was very honest about it. He said, it's hard for me to take my eyes off of her. Down the aisle comes the typical single makeout man. Shirts buttoned all, unbuttoned all the way down to his navel. He got some gold chains flowing over here. And when he spots the open seat next to this gal, he goes and sits down. They begin to talk. And you can tell, he said, my friend said, you can tell he's putting a move on. And I mean, the plane takes off. And I mean, this guy is really in, engaging this gal. And she's listening to him. And finally, about halfway through the flight, the girl pulls a great one. She opens up her bag and pulls out a Bible. She begin reads. She begins to read the Bible to the makeout man. She shares the gospel with the makeout man. The plan, the plane lands. Everybody's up in the aisle. They're trying to get out. But over here was this beautiful lady and the makeout man, and she's got her hand on his shoulder and she's praying and leading him to Christ. Now you'll never know that lady's name. That's what it means to have a testimony. You don't have to be up front like this. The best things, the greatest stuff happens with, with hardly anybody knowing about it. That's what we're to be about. That makeout man got a makeover. He got a new makeover. A friend of mine that I knew uh, uh, for years had a great impact all across the world, and especially this country, was putting on an event here in 1972 in Dallas. He came to a man whom I will not mention but knew and said, I need $100 million to put on this event that's going to bring people from all across the country and out of the country. It could make an impact for years to come. The man raised with his buddies the $100 million, and an impact was made for Christ. There's a campaign going on now if you watch television. He gets us. There are a couple guys in Kansas City that are literally putting millions of dollars in to get that message out. You might read about them if you want. One of my buddies is working with a group company here, the marketing group that's organizing the whole deal. I discipled one of those guys who's leading that. But they're missing a couple things in my estimation, and that's getting a succinct presentation of the gospel to every man in America and a way to follow it up. I don't know what they're going to do, but I sure admire, sure admire what they're doing. They really care. I've got three granddaughters. One of them's named Josie. She's the young one, ninth grader. She goes out for cross country, first time ever, not even working out. Big uh, public high school in Marietta, Georgia, north of Atlanta. And within a week, the coach puts, moves her up to the varsity from the JV team. At the end of the season, she's made the state tournament. She is running 
against 273 upperclassmen, seniors, juniors, and sophomores, comes in 15th, 15th, a ninth grader. And she was voted for her whole region, the number one ninth grader in that state. Ninth grader, little skinny thing, running like the wind. But one day in one of the meets, she didn't seem to be running uh, with the same passion. And my daughter and, and, and uh, her, Joe, uh, uh, my daughter's husband and Josie's dad said, something's wrong. So when it was over, they go over and say, hey, you had a great race, but you didn't seem like you were really getting with it. You kind of dropped back so some other people went ahead of you. What's that all about? And Josie's very humble, but she said, well, one of my friends was struggling in the back, and I slowed down because I didn't want her to be alone. That comes out of a family that loves Jesus, and they're making a great difference in their kids' lives. That's what God builds in. That humility, caring about others. It's not about me, it's about him and about others. Well, first step. When I was in Orlando, I really had a heart. This was on the heels of the Rodney King riots in L.A. The Orlando Magic had come to town. They cleared out a whole area downtown to build the arena, the parking. But on one corner, there was a little rec center. And one day I was going over uh, to, to practice uh, to watch the, the team play or practice. There were five or six little black kids looking in the rec door. I said, what's going on? I said, well, the Magic are doing a camp. And I said, why aren't you all in there? He said, because it costs $200. I said, hmm. So I called a buddy in Austin, David, and I said, David, we need to put a basketball camp on. So we started a thing called First Step Foundation, First Step Basketball. The last year we did it, before I moved here, we had 700 inner city kids in our camp, three gyms going simultaneously. I had put together about 70 coaches, and it was a remarkable camp. Anybody that did camps in Orlando or Central Florida said this is the best run camp going. And so I won't tell you all we did at the camp, but I will tell you the one thing. The camp was just a hook to get the kids to come. The last year we did this, over 400 of the 700 kids gave their life to Christ. But more than that, I had recruited almost 200 men through our gathering of men like this there. And these men came to the last day of camp and picked one to three kids each to mentor them, disciple them for one year. No camp on the planet that I know of does that. And so one of these uh, one of these, or two of these guys, Rob and Kent, took two boys from the same family, a family of nine kids in a little apartment with a single mom, one bathroom. Over a period of time, their heart was moved to build this lady a house. So they built her a wonderful home. Then, as God led them and they spent time with these two boys, they saw the, the hope in the, that these boys had, but they needed some help. They sent both of these boys to college. Got them all the way through. Two guys from a basketball camp took them on and all this stuff. And I could tell you stories about all those men and stuff that they did with these boys. First step camp. When I was in seminary, uh, I didn't have any money. I worked in the cafeteria to get through the seminary. But once every two, three months, an envelope came in the mail with no address on it other than my address with cash on the inside praying for you. To this day, I still don't know who sent that money. Didn't care about getting credit, but the check came in and I was grateful for it. So what do, what do we need to do? You know, one of the biggest things I think we can do, fellas, is we can learn to be nice. Every day, as you go about your deal, be nice. Now, I do something really ugly. If, if, there, if there was a female coming this way, I hold the door open for them. Now, that's nice. But what's not nice when they don't tell me thanks? <laughs> you know what I do? Thank you, and walk on. I got to stop doing that. I still want to open the door. I got a lot of work. But anyway, a little girl prayed this prayer. God, make all the bad people good and all the good people nice. 
Some people that are Christians and in churches can be as mean as a snake. Let's be honest about it. My wife, Punky, some of you have had knee surgery, hip surgery. She had two knees put in since January and, and another one in March. I called her this morning and said, Punky, one of the girls is going to help out at the desk where you came in, pooped out, and uh, can you come in? She didn't even hesitate. I'll be there. Two knees, working on getting well again. She's back there. The things my wife does, the little things she does that nobody will ever know about, absolutely blows me away to care for people, to pray for people, to go meet with people. Tonight, there will be about 12 to 13 young girls in their 20s that will be in our living room, and she'll spend two hours with them, bringing them along into faith, giving her life away to them. So there's a verse in the Bible. i got a couple more things to say. Don't go yet. There's a verse in the Bible in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. We've got to learn to do the little things with no notice well. We've got to learn to take initiative towards people and not wait till we know there's a need. If you know there's a need, move to the person. Don't wait. If you see somebody's lost as a goose and doesn't know the Lord, have coffee with them and bring the subject up. So, so where are you going when it's all over here? Don't be afraid to ask the question. We are too timid in our faith. We don't need to be bulldozers coming and beating over the head, people over the head with the Bible. We got to take more initiative. We got to do that. So I was in uh, <clears throat> Washington a couple years ago, a number of years ago, with a friend. We were headed to Reagan Airport, and um, my buddy said, Have you ever seen the Vietnam Memorial? I said, Never seen it. Heard about it. He said, We got plenty of time. Asked the cab driver to pull over. We get out. Walked over this beautiful grassy area, finally came up to the main place where the, where the Vietnam Memorial was. And the way it works, if you've been there, you go to this register, you can scroll down, and you can find a name and where it's on the wall. And I remembered, as we were there, my best buddy in high school, Sherry Hadley, all-American track star, straight-A student, but my friend, most of all, uh, was killed in that conflict when he was 21 years old. So I found his name. I walked down the walkway. Nobody laughs, nobody talks. I finally came to the portion of the wall where his name was supposed to be, and I went down, and boom, Sherry Hadley. I can't describe to you how I felt at that moment. Not just seeing the name, not remembering the great times we had had together, not, not remembering all the, 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 the great things he had done for me, but you see, the most important thing was when I was a sophomore in high school, Sherry Cadillac had the courage to ask me to go to a week-long camp where one night I gave my life to Christ. Oh. You see, fellas, that's what it's all about. Nothing else matters. That's what matters. He left something that's going to last forever. And even though he's dead and with the Lord and alive with the Lord, I'm still running around here. And when I leave, there are going to be people that God allowed me to touch. They're going to go on, and they're going to touch people's lives. What an opportunity we have. So these people, 50 people, all over the age of 95, said, you know, if I could do it over again, I'd reflect more, I'd risk more, and I'd do more things that would outlive me. Now, as I close, here's the frustrating thing about these meetings that we're in right here. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know if you've even heard a word I said. But God has a way of pinging people's minds and hearts. And I hope he's done it with you today. So I'll close with this. Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, um, tells about a make-believe country where only ducks live. One Sunday morning, all the ducks came to church, waddled down the aisle, waddled to their pews, and squatted. Then the duck minister came in, took his place behind the pulpit, opened the duck Bible, and read, Ducks, 
You have wings, and with wings you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky ducks. You have wings. And all the ducks yelled, Amen, and got up and waddled home. (laughs) Don't waddle home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each man in this room. I don't know all that's going on in their hearts, but you do. And Lord, if there are men here today that do not have you in their lives, I pray they'll pray a simple prayer, and right now they can pray it. Jesus, come into my life. Clean me up. But from this day forward, help me to become the man you've always wanted me to be. And Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that we would be deeply moved in our hearts by what you've done for us on the cross. And that we would realize that no one else has ever done what you've done. No one will ever love us like you love us. No one has ever promised a present and a future like you have promised. And so out of gratitude, Lord, I pray that we would give our lives to you anew and fresh today. And say, Lord, use me. Use me. Help me to make a difference while I'm here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, fellas. See you in September.